members of our group. And got the recording, thank you. Um, I'll start, I'll do the introductions and then I'll pass it over to uh, Dave Patterson who will uh, highlight everything that we'll be doing. First of all, again, welcome. And I just want to particularly speak to the uh, sponsored members. Um, congratulations on being picked by your unit. Um, we have 40 members that are being sponsored by the various units. And I'm just gonna quickly just go over the list of uh, how many people, how many members from each of the units. So you get a bit of a scope on where we, you're all from. From Joint Signal Regiment, we have five. From CFIOG, we have four from Canada and one from the UK. Uh, school, CIFSI, we have two. Special Operations Force, we have one. Um, 77 Line, we have two. One from 76 Com Regiment. One from one SIGS, one from two SIGS one from five SIGs and um, two uh, support group on Montreal, um, two from EW Regiment, two from 31 Signal Regiment, three from 32 Signal Regiment, one from 33 Signal Regiment, two from 34, one from 35, one from 36, three from 37, two from 38, one from 39, and one from my alma mater, 41 Signal Regiment, um, one from uh, KN Division Support Group, Toronto area, and a certain Master Corporal Slon White, who was on our 2020 list and who will be joining us and is not sponsored by a particular unit, but raised his own funds. So we're coast to coast, representing just about every branch unit that we have in the forces. So congratulations. Um, you're gonna be going on a pretty good tour. As well as we'll have 19 members that are non-sponsored who are either retired, friends, of the branch family um, who can who have a, a deep desire to go and join you on this. And we're gonna have so, and they bring a lot of experience as well. So they're you're to pick their brains and they're to pick your brains. So in order to qualify this, um, you had to be the most deserving member from your own unit. And you had to be a corporal, private, a master corporal, officer cadet, second lieutenant, or lieutenant, which means you really are the future of our branch in advance. So this is only going to help you with your education and your experiences as we go forward on this. We're targeting 62 people to join us. Uh, we're currently at 59. So if you know any others serving, non-serving, that want to join us, um, for, the next, for the next three, we can get you in at a reduced rate. Um, a part of what we had to do for all of this is putting it together was really in, you could say, in um, three phases. Um, as amply put by the Colonel Commandant in his um, opening letter on the study session, it, uh, this is not a wine tour. This is an, is an educational and experience tour. Everyone is expected to research the campaign and the singling stories and uh, present their experiences upon return to their unit. So spreading the word. There'll be interaction between the historians, retired people, serving and the like, both Canadian and Dutch, as well as all the reading material and the resource material will be on the main SimSend sites. 
and in there, um, for the tour itself is really into three phases. The first phase is getting everybody on the plane on the 29th of April. And getting to that point was comprised of a lot of meetings. The original tour was scheduled for May of 2020. And as all of you know, COVID hit and um, everything was paid for. So everything had to be rearranged, canceled, refunds negotiated, a lot of time and a lot of work. So we've got to the point where we can kick this off. One of the main stumbling blocks on getting the tour going would have been the government still had the tour advisory, the travel advisory on, but uh, that has just been released. So now we're free to go. Um, the second part of the, of the phase is the um, study sessions. There'll be six of them, and they'll provide you, the sponsored soldier, with a greater background and information on the main operations that occurred before and during the actual liberation of the Netherlands, concentrating on the January to May 1945 timeframe. Uh, this initiative will provide a very meaningful dialogue and exchanges that you have during the tour. So again, pick everybody's brain as much as you can. Then we get into the final phase, the tour itself lasts for 10 days. Um, where did the money come from? The funding. Each trip is gonna cost about $4,500. 2,500 of that is coming from your unit directly. About 1,700 is coming from the Electronics and Communications Foundation study fund. And the money that was inputted for this fund came from donations as headed by the Colonel Commandant through private and industry um, not donations. This process is still ongoing. And the last $300 of the trip is coming from you personally. Now, what does this provide? This provides the airfare to and from Toronto, plus the airfare from all the outlying cities, wherever you're, you're from. So you just got to get yourself to an airport. And Merit Travel, who is our travel agency, will take care of you from there. They will do all that arranging. Um, for the Ontario units, for the most part, uh, I guess Petawawa, Ottawa, Kingston, it'll be done by bus. And this is a TBD thing uh, still to be arranged, but that's the, the easiest and cheapest way we can get everybody together in, into Toronto. So everybody's going to go on the same flight that is sponsored leaving Toronto on the 29th. So it includes the airfare includes the uh, tour cost itself, which is comprised of the tour, the hotel, most meals, most meals meaning um, all the breakfasts, uh, most lunch, except for the 8th of May, and um, two dinners, the combined dinner towards the end and the opening reception at the start. And what's classified as no fault insurance. So in case, push comes to shove and things still transpire. We have uh, the best insurance that we can get. And it's comprised of uh, COVID related insurance as well as no fault insurance. So for example, if you're designated to go on and you are medically unfit, you break a leg, that is covered. If you're all of a sudden called out to an operation to go to where, wherever, that's covered. So I think we've covered most of our bases on that, hopefully. And now in order to get us to this point, there's a lot of background work and uh, that, that needed to be done outside of organizing the, the uh, tour itself just to get you there. And a lot of that work or some of the work was done by the Netherlands um, Planning Committee. I have, the, uh, uh, being fortunate, of being the uh, chair for that. I volunteered for that. 
I um, am a Dutch Canadian, actually technically a first generation, born in Beck Limburg in the south. My parents were raised um, in Beck, which is just north of Maastricht. Um, during the depression and through the war years, and they were actually liberated by the Americans. The Americans first came through there uh, on their way to the Rhine, and then the, then the British um, occupied for a while. So they never did see any Canadians. And my father decided to immigrate to Canada. So I was eight months old when I came over in 1950. And the, and the reason he chose Canada was that because it didn't have the draft. Going through the depression, going through the war, really didn't want to see anything else on that. Of the two sons and three sisters, four of us ended up wearing the sea of greens. So his plan somewhat backfired in, in retrospect. Um, I'd like to also introduce all the members of the planning committee, uh, Major Louis Lemaire, who's currently uh, the ops officer at JSR, and who will also be the officer commanding for the command team while you're in the Netherlands. Um, he was also responsible for the point of contact for anybody concerning the tour for all the Kingston area you know, units. Lieutenant Catherine Bouchard, uh, Boucher is ops officer for line for four line squadron, um, responsible for all contact within 77 um, line regiment and 76 com group units. Lieutenant uh, Leonard on the goal, a capacity support a CFIOG responsible for all the contact members within CFIOG. MWO Mike Mahar, um, SSM 2 Squadron, 37 Signal Regiment, will, will also be the tour SSM. Um, and he was responsible for liaising with all the reserve units. Also, um, we have our Colonel Commandant, Brigadier General, retired Kevin O'Keefe who was the driver behind this tour starting in 2018 and has been with this project ever since. He's the driving force behind this. He's the mentor to us all. He's the person that got all the funding from, the, from private individuals and, uh, and the industry. He's also the chair of the planning committee uh, finance chair, the money, as well as the uh, tour director within the planning committee. Sir, would you mind uh, saying a few words? Sure, uh, thanks, uh, thanks you. I'm sitting here with the uh, incoming Colonel Commandant as well, Brigadier General Jose Robidoux, for those of you who know uh, Brigadier General Robidoux. Um, thanks very much, Hugh, and uh, really all the credit uh, has to go to, uh, to Hugh and his team for putting, uh, bringing this back together. It really honestly was a struggle uh, once the uh, tour in 2020 was, uh, was canceled, trying to recover as much of our funds as we could and uh, going through uh, that whole process and then once that was completed to make a decision whether or not we were going to do it again. And the only way that we could do it again is by uh, getting uh, people like uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jansen, um, Major Lemaire, uh, MWO uh, Mahar, uh, Lieutenant Legault uh, and uh, Captain Boucher uh, to actually go out to all of the units and try to uh, convince uh, the leadership of the units that uh, doing this again was the right thing to do. And uh, through their incredible efforts, uh, as uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jansen has said, we now have uh, 40 uh, individuals who are going to go across. And in a few minutes, you'll hear uh, General Patterson uh, describe the itinerary and Hugh as well, some of the other events that will take place uh, around uh, the actual battlefield studies themselves. And uh, you're, um, you're, quite, you're going to benefit immensely from uh, what you're going to see and hear. And the tremendous benefit that you gain is to 
uh, not only have the experiences of, of being there and seeing what our Canadian soldiers uh, uh, did so courageously and gallantly in, in support of the liberation, but being able to celebrate them and commemorate them uh, through uh, some of the events that we will take place, that uh, we will participate in and, and, and you, will take, you will see happen. Uh, it's a, a remarkable opportunity for you. Uh, I um, am looking forward to uh, seeing it uh, executed finally after um, being involved with this since November of, 19, of 2018. I was gonna say 1918 and it feels like that, uh, but, uh, but 2018. Uh, um, General Patterson has put together an impressive itinerary. Uh, you'll be able to go and, and walk in the footsteps of uh, all of the uh, Canadian uh, operations around uh, Market Garden, uh, around uh, um, uh, Operation Blockbuster, and uh, Operation Bodenplatt, which is a little bit of a different one uh, than we had pl planned for 2020. And Bodenplatt is uh, the final uh, major uh, uh, German air offensive of the Second World War. And, you, and General Patterson will be able to take you to some of the considerations and issues that were associated with that uh, during that, uh, that campaign. So that's about it from my perspective. Uh, I'm quite excited to, uh, to see the level of participation that we have. Uh, I'm quite excited of, uh, that the representation is from across Canada. We didn't quite have this uh, representation for 2020. And, and now, as I tell the leadership of our branch, we have uh, people from every signal unit that we have and every communication electronics formation. Quite an accomplishment. And again, all of the credit goes to Hugh and his team. So uh, listen out uh, for things as, uh, as uh, they unfold. Uh, we have uh, scheduled a, a number of uh, these types of events, uh, Zoom uh, calls over the course of the next while. And uh, the introduction of those will be done by uh, General Patterson and, um, and uh, uh, John Rickard uh, to give you a sense, a little bit of a strategic overview of, of uh, what's going to happen. But I've also asked that uh, each of you in those groups, just to go do a little bit more uh, digging, if, uh, if I could use that term, and to see if we can come up with some nuances that might be of interest to our communication electronics community uh, who are attending. Uh, little things associated with maybe some of the uh, the command and control challenges that uh, our Canadian um, forces face, or some of the geographic challenges. You know, all of you are communicators, so you can imagine some of the difficulty that um, the uh, the uh, organization, the Canadian forces uh, operations, found in, in operating over flooded terrain, or without uh, the opportunity to uh, find a good. Um, spots for, um, for a radio broadcast or, or things such as that nature. So anything that you can come up with that might be of interest that are, uh, is above and beyond what uh, General Patterson and Mr. Rickert will be, uh, will be presenting. So that's all I have for me, uh, Hugh. That's more than I wanted to say, but thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to talk to people. Uh, thank you, sir. Um... Now it's appropriate, I hand it over to Brigadier General Retired um, Dave Patterson, who is gonna tell us or, or have us go through the itinerary and of course will be one of the uh, tour guides. He's currently a director of uh, Fields of Fire that is running the tour for us. Dave, over to you. Thank you, Hugh, can you, can you hear me okay? All good, all right. And so, well, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Dave Patterson. I'm the proprietor of Fields of Fire Tours, and we'll be running the tour on the ground for you. When you get, uh, when you all arrive at uh, Ishkipo Airport in the Netherlands, we'll be waiting for you. And uh, what I'm going to do through tonight is go through the itinerary. Uh, you may have had a chance to look at it on the piece of paper, but I'll explain a little bit more about what we'll be doing on a day by day basis and some of the things that we'll see and do when we're over there. Uh, I have a slide in the, in the presentation where I introduce my, my team, who I'm, the team is going to help us out. But I figure rather than coming out of the presentation and showing their, their, their lovely faces on the screen, I'll let them uh, give them a, a couple of a bursts of information. But about myself first, I'm a retired artillery officer, uh, and, and I actually currently work for the commissioner.
since COVID has, uh, has pretty much shut it down since, uh, since last year. Uh, joining me on the tour will be two other people. Uh, there'll be uh, Major John Rickard, who works at the Staff College in Union Kingston, uh, is on the Professional Military Education staff, uh, has a PhD in military history. And uh, County Colonel retired Ron Bragdon, uh, airborne soldier, who will be helping out in the background, making sure things go smoothly, making sure we get into the museum smoothly, sort of our support, my the support team for the tour as we go through. So I'll give them uh, each a couple of minutes here, starting with uh, John, just to give a little background on yourself and uh, as we go forward. Right, can everyone see me and hear me? Okay, uh, I'd like to thank uh, General Patterson for the opportunity to be here. And I'd like to thank the uh, organizers of the group for uh, allowing me to participate. It's a great honor. Uh, I'm a serving Strathcona. Currently work at the Staff College, as General Patterson said, uh, focused on uh, professional military education. Uh, my PhD is in military history with a focus on the Second World War. Uh, I've written uh, several books. Um, one book was on General Annie McNaughton. Uh, that was in 2010. I've written uh, three books on General Patton. And I'm just completing a large study of uh, General Guy Simmons in Normandy. Um, so I am looking forward to the opportunity of taking you forward into the uh, across the Somme River and uh, going forward into the fall and examining uh, the planning for Market Garden and the planning for Blockbuster and Veritable um, and, and uh, conveying the significant signal challenges uh, in terms of uh, ground communication and air ground communication that we faced uh, that were ubiquitous across the entire uh, Canadian experience uh, in, in whatever theater. Um, so I won't spend uh, any more time on myself. I'll let uh, the others uh, speak, but uh, again, thank you for having me. I'm very, I'm looking forward to the uh, tour very much and getting back to that area. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that you will thoroughly enjoy the experience. Thanks, thanks John. Uh, and, uh... Now I'll ask uh, Ron, Ron Bragdon, to uh, say a few words, introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, Dave. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, John, John, if you could stop sharing your screen if you were whatever, if you were doing that. Yeah, John, get out of there. <laughs> Go ahead, Ron. Okay, Dave, you hear me? Okay, uh, I'm a retired infantry officer. Uh, Patricia served a couple of tours in the Airborne Regiment. Uh, the, the first one was uh, in the early 70s and I uh, got to spend some time in Cyprus during the 74 intervention. My second tour uh, with the Airborne Regiment was in the late 80s and uh, key thing there is we did uh, one of the D-Day celebrations with one can pair and I got to meet and spend time with Fraser Reedy and got to spend time with the uh, brigade commander, uh, uh, James Hill, outstanding leader. And I can see why the Canadians really had a lot of time for him. As Dave said, I'm here to uh, take the administrative burden off your hands as much as possible. I also share with you a uh, connection to Holland. My mom was uh, a war bride. She lived in Svala. My grandfather was with the Dutch resistance. My father was a liberator. And here I is to this day. So looking forward to getting back and uh, having a great tour with you folks. That's all I got. Thanks, Ron. So what I'll do is I'll uh, share my screen now and uh, we'll start the presentation. See that? You all see that? Right. It's good, Dave. Yeah, I'm just trying to find something for me. 
Uh, right, so we've already gone over the team and uh, I'm gonna look at the day-by-day -day itinerary and uh, any kind of uh, questions we might have at the end about, uh, about the trip. Alors, le, le but de notre voyage, c'est de partager un peu l'éducation, la commémoration et renforcer le lien des signaleurs avec euh, le signaleur irlandais euh, et souligner le rôle crucial joué par les signaux pour permettre la libération, la victoire en Europe. So, as we go through day one, day one, the travel day, as I said, uh, as uh, you said, uh, merit travel, and uh, we'll get you to the point of departure and get you on that plane. Fortunately, unlike the trip that I did in Vimy in 2017, uh, most people should all be on the same plane, uh, either in Montreal or Toronto, and uh, get to uh, Amsterdam arriving on the morning of the 30th of April. So that 29th April travel day from wherever you're coming. Uh, if you're coming from, uh, if you're already in Europe or you're uh, uh, coming from somewhere outside of Canada, then uh, meet us at the airport in, in Schiphol in the morning of the 30th. So, 30th of April, we'll get right into it. Uh, no jet lag day. Keep, bu keep busy during jet lag day and then we'll reset your body clocks by the end of the day. So we arrive in Amsterdam, get on our buses and travel to uh, Arnhem. Uh, to the Airborne Museum, uh, which is coming on major renovation during the COVID break. And, uh, it's quite an impressive place. Then uh, tour the Arnhem Battlefields and the Airborne Cemetery, which is just uh, in Osterbeek, just north of, uh, of the, of the uh, museum. And at the end of the day, somewhere around um, four o'clock, five o'clock, checking in the hotel in the Nijmegen. We'll be staying for the whole time, which is another great advantage of this trip. Is you, once you've unpacked, you know, once you've unpacked for the whole trip, uh, and then you have a welcome reception that, that evening before you all collapse into your beds at uh, relatively early and catch up on your on your sleep. So those are some pictures. That's the Airborne Museum in the top left. With the, 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 the older building was actually the headquarters of the division during the battle. If you've ever seen the Bridge Too Far, movie, well, that uh, the Hardenstein Hotel was uh, the headquarters for Roy Urker and his staff, and they've added both an underground portion of the museum and then above ground, that's the gift shop, uh, in the glass and steel building. Uh, interestingly, the Sherman tank that's outside it is a Canadian Sherman tank because in April of 45, it was the Canadian tank supporting the British infantry that actually finally liberated the completely destroyed town of Arnhem. Uh, then you have the cemetery, the Airborne Cemetery, and our hotel in uh, Megan, and our Cure Hotel, right in the center of town. I put this slide up just as a, as a Google Earth image, and you can see the, uh, the yellow circle there. That's the hotel, the train station. And as uh, you guys are on sort of a half bench, in other words, your, your, your dinners are except for two of them are on your, on your own. It's sort of highlighted in the orange circles. That's all the restaurants that are within about 600 meters of the hotel. So there is lots and lots of places at various levels of budget to choose from to, uh, to have your dinners. Uh, if we have groups that want to go out in larger groups, then we can have uh, Yolan can call ahead and uh, make reservations for you during the day if you decide you want to go out as a group. But uh, we did a we tried a couple of places when we were there last, and uh, very, very uh, nice town. It's a, it's a busy place, university town, and uh, I think it is a nice, uh, nice city center there. And those, for those of you who will be missing your, your morning North American coffee, there's a Starbucks about 200, about 150 meters away from the hotel. So you can get your uh, Americano, your lattes, or whatever you, whatever you want. The hotel, of course, itself has a restaurant and a bar. Uh, and, and we have our, of course, our breakfasts and our bag lunches every day before we set out in the buses to our, uh, on our tour. That's the town of Nijmegen. 
day three, which is the first of May, that's when we do Operation Veritable. So we go into Germany, uh, see the sites of the, when the first Canadian Army was the largest it ever was, at about 300,000 troops, British and Canadian. Uh, we'll visit the Freedom Museum in Rose Bank and end up at the, not the Canadian, Canadian War Cemetery in Rose Bank as well. And in that cemetery, there are 16. Uh, signalers uh, buried there and one signaler on the memorial to the missing. So we'll make sure that we especially visit those, uh, those grave sites. And there's just some you know, images of the, the map. If uh, Nijmegen is sort of off this map to the left, not very far, as you can see Nijmegen in the top left corner. So the battlefields are very close. That's one advantage of staying in Nijmegen as the battlefields we'll be visiting are by and large fairly close to where we are. So we'll not be on that many long bus trips. The Freedom Museum in the middle there, which has also undergone uh, almost complete renovation since the last time I took a group there. It's much more modern and uh, high tech, and a nice, nice spot. And uh, the cemetery at Grosby, which is the largest uh, Canadian cemetery in the Netherlands. We have a ceremony there for that day, depending on what the tour group wants to do or at the cemetery in Holt. Day four, back out of the battlefields. So we'll have two, three battlefield days in a row, which is uh, this with a good pace. There's an Operation Blockbuster, which is the follow on to Veritable, the, the battles of the Hawkwald, capture the clearing of the West Bank of the Rhine, operation for the crossing of the Battle of the Hawkwald Gap, and the, the overall battle of Operation Blockbuster. Day five on the 3rd of May well, is, it, is this the Signals Day, if you like, Signals Culture Day. We're going to visit the Dutch Signals Museum in Amersfoort. Uh, visit the site of the truce negotiations in Achterveld. And, uh, this plan, and uh, Kevin and you can confirm this, but the plan to unveil a, a plaque or a monument at the Dutch Signal Corps barracks in Stro. You'll, you'll often see, because we have two buses and we can't really it's difficult to put everybody at the same place at the same time because of the capacity of museums and that sort of thing. So you'll see, for example, the Dutch Signal Museum in Actorville, where one bus will go to one thing and one bus will go to the other, and then halfway through they'll switch. And then we all meet up in the afternoon at the, uh, at the Signals Barracks in the in Stro. That's uh, just an image from the Signals Museum. There's a Enigma machine. This is the site of the truce in Octorville. And if you're not aware of that situation, about the, uh, the war ended in the Netherlands on the 5th of May, but there was a truce in the Western part of the Netherlands from about the 30th of April uh, to allow food to be brought to the Dutch who were starving in the cities of in the big city of Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Utrecht, because the Germans had, had banned the import of food after the Dutch railways went on strike during Operation Market Garden in, in September, they thought they were being liberated, so they all went on strike and to punish the Dutch. They basically took away all their food. So farmers being farmers, they, they farmers always have food, but the people in the, in the cities were starving. So the Germans uh, realized this, the Dutch, uh, the Dutch were hearing about it, the Dutch in England, and they pleaded with the Canadians and British to arrange a truce, and that was done in this building, in this photo, which is still there, it's a, it was a school at the time. Now it's a community center and they have a little mini museum. So the Germans came over and negotiated the troops. And the Canadian trucks with Canadian truck drivers drove up to the, to the front line full of food and Dutch truckers took them over, uh, brought them into the towns and brought them back. So about like, two or three days before the war ended, it actually ended in this part of the Netherlands. And then at the bottom, you've got the this, uh, Google Earth image of the Stroke Signals barracks down there. And, uh, all, of, all around the same area, actually. They're all pretty close together, these three sites. Before we get into the ceremonial part of it, uh, day, the 4th of May is Dutch Remembrance Day, the day before Liberation Day. This is when the more solemn ceremonies happen. The picture on the left is the national ceremony that we have in Ottawa, where they have in Amsterdam, and that's the king and the queen. And they sit the National War Memorial, which is right at the center of uh, Amsterdam. 
and that, that day we are so far we hear that the Canadian Cemetery will be in the Canadian War Cemetery at Holton, which is the other major Canadian cemetery, or one of three major Canadian cemeteries in the Netherlands. So that has yet to be confirmed, and so we may have to move things around a bit. So far, they're telling us that that is the that is the, the way it's going to be. Excuse me. Now the way the Dutch work their commemorations, it's only every five years that these days, both the fourth and the fifth, are actually holidays. In between, they have ceremonies, and the king and queen would lay a wreath. And in five years, so like 2020, which would have been the 75th anniversary, but then it, uh, it's basically a national holiday. Uh, and it will be again in 2025. The question will be, what will they decide to do in 2022, having canceled both the 2020 and the 2021 uh, travel and ceremonies? So once again, what we're hearing, and I have a, a good friend of mine, is the attache in Munich. Uh, so from the Canadian side, we're hearing what they're planning is that they are planning to do something. It, it won't be a national holiday, but it'll be bigger than it would normally have been on an off year, if you like. But there will be ceremonies there that we will participate in. The Canadians and the Dutch will get together and commemorate. I guess it might not be as, as large as it would have been in 2020. The prochain jour, c'est le 5 mai, c'est le jour de la libération. Donc, le, le, le 4 mai, c'est un jour solennel, le 5 mai, c'est un jour de joie. Euh, donc, euh, la libération de, de Pays-Bas, euh, une parade pour, pour nous à Wageningen. Wageningen est le lieu où le, le se rend, le, les Allemands se seront, où les Germans se rendent, 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 où les Germans so in Wageningen, there will be a, a parade. Uh, in 2020, the plan was that the, the, the uniform contingent of our group would participate in the parade. Uh, we have yet to confirm that with the organizer, depending on the size and scale of the parade, given, as I said, that it's an off year. But uh, there will be definitely will be a, an event in Wageningen. If you, there's a Wageningen uh, 45 or, or 75 website that, is, that is, keeps people up to date about what's going on. It's all in Dutch, but it, my, my computer translates it automatically for me. Um, and also, from a practical point of view, A7 will be test day. So if we still have to provide a COVID test within 72 hours of returning to Canada, well, this is the, th the three days before we return. So that day, either at the hotel or wherever we arrange it, we will all take a COVID test and have the results ready to present when we come back to, uh, to Canada. Ron will uh, personally stick the swabs up your nose uh, as, we, as we go along. Oh. Day six, day six is our area, as, uh, as uh, Colonel Commandant mentioned, is our uh, RCAF day. So uh, we, uh, we decided to, to orient that visit around a place called Dalian, Dalian Airfield, which during the battles up until uh, early April was actually a German airfield. And then the RCAF took it over at the end of the war. Uh, but at that airfield, which is actually a museum and is still an airfield, uh, is, was the German Air Force Command bunker for that part of the Netherlands. It's quite an interesting little site, and uh, got a local local friend who, who's very familiar with it. He's going to take us through there, uh, and also talk about Operation Bodenplatt, which was uh, the last gasp offensive of the Luftwaffe on the first of January, 1945, and uh, where they attacked uh, dozens of airfields, expecting that most of the most of the staff would be have a sort of a uh, heavy heads after a night of celebrating on New Year's Eve. Uh, lots of air, aircraft on the ground. Uh, some Canadian squadrons took quite heavy casualties in aircraft uh, around Eindhoven, around uh, Arnhem, uh, south of Arnhem, and, uh, and uh, but we're going to sort of look at that and the whole issue of uh, air, the Germans' attempt to uh, 
describe this German attempt to, to pull their own version of the Battle of the Bulge by the air. On day seven, day seven is, uh, sorry, day nine, which is the 7th of May, uh, is your free day. So there are several options on the table right now, and other things can could develop as we go along. But primarily right now, the three options we're looking at is uh, sort of take it easy and explore in Nijmegen. Nijmegen's a beautiful city with lots of the history of itself, some interesting museums. There's also that's the Nijmegen Bridge and the 82nd Airborne, uh, where they fought during Operation Monkey Card. If you remember the, uh, the movie, that's where uh, they crossed the river in the boats. And so there's that option. Uh, the next option is, is one of the buses or depending on how many people, the buses will go to Amsterdam for the day. It's about uh, an hour and a half, two hour, probably a two hour bus ride. Uh, if they're if they're in the morning, you get a few hours to wander around Amsterdam. Uh, the other option is you could take the train. We are sitting right next to the train station. The trains leave at seven o'clock in the morning. And uh, every 20 minutes, uh, till about uh, almost 11.30 at night leaving from Amsterdam. So the intent is for everybody to come back to, uh, to the hotel. That's, uh, that's certainly the intent of the organizers. I'll leave that to the, uh, to the staff. On day 10, that's our travel day. So we'll leave uh, from the airport early to catch our flights to, uh, to Toronto, Montreal. And then once again, we'll get your onward travel back to where you're going. For those, of, if there are any, if there's anyone who is deciding to stay on in the Netherlands or, or elsewhere in Europe uh, after the trip, well, then either on the day nine uh, or or day ten, you could uh, you could take your leave and, and catch your and make your arrangements for your onward travel from Nijmegen or wherever you're going. Uh, mm -hmm. If you decided to stay on uh, in Europe, uh, obviously we'll have to uh, have to know that, and so we know where. And some people are leaving us on various on those either of those two days. So that's uh, that's the end of the itinerary questions. There are a couple of events. Maybe I don't know, maybe who wants to speak to in terms of the uh, the reception and then the march across the bridge, which happens. Uh, I think we decided on the uh, uh, that happens on day. Scroll back here. I think it's day four, isn't it? The, the fourth of May we decided on view for the march across the bridge in Nijmegen. Um, basically, what what the, what the Dutch have been doing every day uh, since uh, before the commemorations is there's a brand new footbridge that crosses the, the Wall River, the, the river at Nijmegen, and at uh, sunset every day uh, they they march across it in honor of the the troops that crossed the river uh, to liberate to help liberate the town, and the, as you march across it, the, the streetlights come on on the bridge. As you march uh, across there, and different groups uh, lead the uh, contingents, uh, and people follow behind you as you walk across this bridge. So I think the day we were arranging it for for our group was so that we could be the main contingent, as opposed to just uh, just uh, part of the crowd. I think it was the fourth, was it not? Uh, well, we'll confirm that one of those days. Uh, it was the other day, uh, on the day of the reception, there'll be a couple of briefings. I think we're meeting with uh, a Dutch a Dutch lady who, uh, uh, yeah, a welcome reception, a Dutch lady who uh, who's a great friend of the Singlers who's gonna meet us at, that, uh, at the hotel that night. So that's the, uh, I'll shut down the, the presentation now so we can see if any, any hands go up. But if anybody has any questions at this time for me on the itinerary, I'd be happy to, uh, to answer. Just uh, use the reaction button on the bottom there. And you see it says raise hand. You raise your hand, turn on your mic, and you can ask, and you can ask a question. Go ahead, uh, Arnie. Uh, I'm sitting here with uh, Captain Retired Wise wrote, who is a retired nurse, a military nurse. And I think we mentioned before that she would like a little bit of, not emphasis, but just, you know, occasional mention of what the medical world was doing in those days. That's all. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Nijmegen became a major center for hospitals and uh, that sort of thing as the, as the battle came along. So we're in a town that was used as a, as a hub of uh, medical support to the Canadians uh, once we moved north uh, into, into Northern Holland. So absolutely. All right, simple question. Thank you. Anyone else for any questions or? Okay, so for no other questions, then uh, I'll hand back over to you, Hugh. Thank you, Dave. Um, that was really good insight into the details of what's actually going to transpire. I know there's still a few loose ends, but uh, that will be resolved very shortly. There, 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 things are going our way uh, quite quickly now that uh, things are opening up. Thank you again. And uh, I'll look forward. I actually convinced one of my sisters to come along with me on this trip as well. So, uh, and she was one of the ones that were in uniform. Okay, now um, I have a slide presentation as well. Let me uh, start that going right now. And could I get feedback whether people can see the first uh, slide? Okay, good, we're good. Okay, um, so we've already done the intro, so I'm just gonna go over some of the highlights. And just waiting for my laptop to uh, gen up here to go to the next slide. Check, 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 check. Okay, um, battlefield study, we've already talked about this um, and I'll just go into the, the first part. Uh, one of the highlights would, um, for us to be, it's coming upon us to, to, of course, to pay homage and honor those that have died in the cause. The first cemetery, as David mentioned, on day three, the 1st of May, will be Grosbeck, uh, right beside the town of Grosbeck. Grosbeck um, in English means Green Brook. The Allied forces entered Netherlands on the 12th of September, 44. Airborne operations later that month established a bridgehead at Nijmegen, and in the following months, coastal areas and ports were cleared and secured. It was not until the Germans initiated offensive in the Ardennes had been repulsed that the drive into Germany could begin. Most of those buried in Grosbeck Canadian War Cemetery were Canadians, most of whom died in the Battle of the Rhineland when the 2nd and 3rd Canadian Infantry Divisions and the 4th Canadian Armoured Div took part in the drive southwards from Nijmegen to clear the territory between the Maas and the Rhine in February and March of 45. Others buried there died earlier or later in the southern part of the Netherlands and in the Rhineland. The cemetery contains 2,610 Commonwealth personnel from the Second War, of which 2,338 were Canadians. And of nine war graves from other nationalities. Um, then on the other cemetery is the Holden War Cemetery. The Netherlands fell to the Germans in May 1940, was not re-entered by the Allied forces until September 44. A great majority of those buried in Holland Canadian War Cemetery died during the later stages of the war in Holland. During the advance of the Canadian Second Corps into Northern Germany and across the Mainz in April and the first days of May 45. After the end of the hostilities, their remains were brought together in the cemetery. Holden Canadian War Cemetery contains 1,393 Commonwealth Commonwealth burials from the Second World War. 
of these, 1,355 Canadians are buried. As David alluded to, on the evening of the fourth day, calculated to be at 1904 hours, the sunset march. This was one of the famous bridges on Operation Market Garden. And the first picture you see there was just soon after his capture. Just a second. The Sunset March is a daily contribute to those allied soldiers who fought for the liberation of the Netherlands, especially those soldiers who lost their lives. In 2013, the city of Nijmegen completed the construction of a new bridge called Overstreck, the crossing. It was constructed close to the area where members of the US 82nd Airborne Division crossed the river wall on 20th of September 44 as part of, Mark, of Operation Mark and Garden. 48 allied soldiers lost their lives during the wall crossing. This recently completed bridge has been installed with 48 pairs of uh, street lights that get turned on as one marches pair by pair in a slow march. Uh, the total time is approximately 12, 12 minutes. This is a picture of the existing new bridge. And I don't know if that bridge in the back is the old bridge or that's a rail bridge. But we will start approximately halfway across, marching in silence and reverence to those that are fallen. Then we will exit the bridge, I don't know which pier, down to the cenotaph at water's edge to pay tribute to the cenotaph that's there and to the, to the fallen soldiers. Every day uh, a ceremony is held and, and every day one could be nominated, it's called a veteran of the day. And on the 2nd of May, our tour, our marching soldiers will be classified the mark of the veteran of the day. So we have the honor of leading ourselves and any other people who want to take part in that, but we will lead the uh, ceremony across the bridge. So that's uh, a great honor. On the Now I got to refer to my note because this thing is day five. Um, there will be a signals memorial dedication at Stro, uh, the Netherlands. Stro, Netherlands is to the Royal Dutch signals as Kingston is to um, our core, i.e., home station. Is also the headquarters of the um, Signals Battalion. What we see in front of us is a picture of um, their a parade square labeled as a memorial square. And you'll see on the far left, two implants of red maple trees. Um, and to be yet erected a plaque. Um, plaque is uh, right here and is sponsored by the CNE branch, paid for by the CNE Association. And it honors those fallen soldiers and those soldiers that were part of the liberation of the Netherlands, both Canadian and Dutch signalers. Um, so we'll be in uniform, serving soldiers will be in uniform for this. The Dutch signals will be part of it and possibly a troop from the British Royal Signals will join us as well. Uh, will be quite a, there'll be a reasonable number 
of special guests, one of which, which is still to be confirmed, is Princess Marguerite. She was the princess that was born in Ottawa in an Ottawa hospital that was temporarily labeled as Dutch territory. So she is to the Royal Dutch signals as Princess Royal, our Princess Anne is to our signals corps, our Royal Canadian Corps of Signals and the CNE branch. So it's a very good fit, one, one could say. Um, Next is day six, where it's, Dave had mentioned Remembrance Day. Um, fourth, uh, the 4th of May is the Dutch Remembrance Day, and of course is akin to our 11th of November. During the, during the evening, um, we're gonna have a talk with, talk by um, Honorary Captain Elizabeth Langford. Let me just give you some background her. During the liberation of the Netherlands, the Canadian Army in 1945, a unit, the Royal Canadian Corps of Signals, was located in Amphidrome, across the street where Elizabeth and her destitute family were living. Her parents were very active in the Dutch resistance. The Signals unit supported their family during the liberation and developed a special relationship with then seven-year-old Elizabeth frequently inviting over for breakfast during the period of April and May in 45. Before the signals units moved on in late May 94, 1945, they made seven-year-old Elizabeth an honorary captain in the Royal Canadian Corps of Signals, unofficially, of course. They presented her with the insignia of an RCS captain and their mother sewed the badges on this little blue jacket. He kept the jacket for over 70 years. Over those 70 years, Elizabeth reached out to the Signal Corps to reestablish contact through our Colonel Commandant and extended her appreciation. In, in 2016 and 17, the Colonel Commandant of the branch sponsored, corresponded with Elizabeth to correspond her visit to Kingston and eventual donation of a little blue jacket to RCNA Museum. On the 20th of September, 2017, Commandant of the school and the Colonel Commandant, uh, Kevin O'Keefe hosted this lovely lady for, lady for a reception and a public lecture at the Communication Electronic Museum in Kingston. So that sweater resides, resides in our archives in the museum. So she's going to sort of close the loop for us. On the 4th of May of this Remembrance Day, um, our Colonel Commandant uh, paid tribute to Elizabeth and to the Netherlands by um, passing his photograph uh, well in uniform on that day. So he was paying reverence to all of us um, uh, on behalf of uh, the Corps. Thank you, sir. And another highlight will be the wrap up dinner on the evening before the free day, uh, where we can bend the elbow as, as needed and enjoy camaraderie. And of course, this whole tour presents lots of activity for camaraderie. And that's what an underlying purpose of the tour is at several times and locations. So when we get on the buses to the various places, mixing and matching um, is the name of the game. So you get to seat uh, by somebody hopefully new every day and swap stories. On that note, I would they were those are the highlights that I had figured that we could use.
few, I wonder if I can have a couple, just a couple more minutes to uh, talk about a couple of things. One is uh, John Rickard, who was with us, he'll be giving some of the historical presentations as we go through the study sessions, he, either he or I, uh, so that you'll see him uh, giving the presentations on the, on the history. As you mentioned, uh, unlike other tours where we were at different hotels and split up because we're all at the same hotel, it makes it very easy to mix up the buses in the morning, uh, uh, create uh, new, new connections with people as we go through. And then lastly, what I wanted to uh, show you, if, I think some of this will be on the uh, your signals website, I want to share this with you. With some resources for further study, or if you want to read ahead, uh, two of uh, Mark Zolke is a very prolific Canadian history author. He's written about twelve books on Canadian military history from Italy all the way to the end of the war. I think he's completed his set his series now. Uh, the two of the books, in his books that deal with where we will be, are for Forgotten Victory, which is about uh, Veritable and Blockbuster, and On to Victory, which is about the liberation of the Netherlands after the crossing of the Rhine. Terry Kopp's book called Cinderella Army, which covers all the way from the end of Normandy to the end of the war, is probably the best book about the Canadian Army in the Second World War in that, in that part of the operations. There are, if anyone who searched for anything on YouTube, there are dozens of videos on YouTube, some of, of varying quality, but to show images if you want to look at, uh, uh, see, see where the operation was, get, a, get a, a look ahead. There's a particularly good site called On This Day in Canadian Military History, run by a guy named Brad St. Croix. And he uh, edits, a whole lot, edits a whole bunch of uh, Canadian newsreel uh, videos from the Second World War and presents stuff on equipment. Uh, there's some uh, interesting uh, stuff about the Rhineland and uh, showing you what, what vehicles and things look like. Of course, there's the famous uh, Bridge Too Far movie, if you hadn't seen it, from 1977. Uh, probably most of you weren't born when it was uh, when it was first came out, but uh, it is available on YouTube. It's uh, free to watch on YouTube. And there's a, a brand new movie that only came out last Friday uh, called Forgotten Battle. Of, uh, it's a Dutch movie about uh, the liberation of the Schelt. But it's not really about that. It's it's a Dutch story about the resistance. It's an interesting story. It's a it's a good movie. It's not the greatest history, but Canadians do figure in it at near the end. Uh, and so uh, and it does a pretty good job of production value of, uh, of showing you what the kit was like and that sort of thing. And there's quite a lot of near the end of Canadian military vehicles in it that were provided by local Indian actors. So there's some resources for you to, uh, if you're interested in reading ahead and uh, getting ready for your presentations as you go through this, uh, this process. And I'm perfectly uh, ready to help anybody who needs uh, more, more direction and more, more pointers as to where to go. That's uh, that's all I have there. To, to uh, thank you, Dave. Um, very purposeful. I'll pass it over to uh, Major Lemaire, joining instruction. Okay, can everybody hear me? Welcome to my studio, <laughs> my home here. Um, so uh, just want to give a quick uh, introduction about myself and uh, the tour sergeant major. Oh, I have, a, I have an assistant tonight, my daughter Alexandra. I'm gonna try not to put her to sleep or actually I'm gonna try and put her to sleep with this presentation. <laughs> so, uh, is the SSM still on board? MWO Mahar? I'm here, sir. Okay, if you want to introduce yourself just really quickly. I know you have to go. Hey, everyone. Yeah, so I don't know if you can see and hear me, but uh, it's MWO Mike Mahar here. I'm uh, the Sergeant Major for 2 Squadron 37 SIGS Regiment. 
been in the unit for uh, 24 years now, joined in uh, 1997, and I've been part of the same unit for, for going on uh, 25 years here now. I uh, was part of the planning committee, and then uh, Colonel Commandant had offered me uh, the position as the kind of to go on the tour as the sergeant major as uh, Major LaMare's fire team partner, and it was uh, an opportunity that I couldn't pass up. And uh, I'm very excited to go on that tour uh, with everybody, represent uh, the Canadian Forces and city side. I'm a, a software developer, so that's what I do full time. Uh, my email was attached in the, uh, the instructions, my city side email. So if anybody has any questions at any time where they're looking for information and they can't get a hold of whoever their normally their point of contact is, they can reach out. Time and uh, I'll get any answers or to the questions that you may have and uh, look forward to joining the tour here and uh, getting things kicked off. I'm actually in the uh, armories right now. We're prepping for a uh, noble exercise noble sky wave, which is kind of the global HF competition. Uh, last year we became 17th out of all the uh, all the teams on the uh, competition. So we're hoping to do better this year. Uh, that's kind of all I have for uh, you. Okay, thanks very much. Enjoy uh, the exercise. Um, so uh, as part of that, I just want to say happy to see any week to everybody. I uh, really hope that uh, everybody's enjoying uh, any senior week activities you might have participated in uh, today or uh, in the last couple of days. So thanks uh, to everybody for that. So I'm just going to kick off with a bit of joint instructions. I've, I've translated some of the highlight points uh, from a draft document that I have uh, going. You'll be receiving uh, joining instructions in the next couple of weeks. Um, but this is the highlight points uh, that are important for you to take away today. Let's see. And just uh, can people give me a thumbs up if they can see the, the next slide here? Okay, so this is uh, sort of the agenda for what we're, I'm going to talk about. So this is the kind of stuff that's going to be in the joint instructions. There's going to be more details in there. There's going to be links and references that you can uh, rely on, and it's going to come in the normal uh, instruction format, you know, situation, mission, etc. So here we go. We have a mission, and I'll just uh, let her, let that sink in for a second while you read it. And, and typo on my part, I copied this and it uh, should be 77. So first and foremost, to get the biggest point out of the way, we've got to talk about COVID-19. So what I would ask everybody is to just be flexible. Um, there's information coming out uh, all the time on this. So I know that everybody's been flexible with everything, but this is, once again, this is a complicated uh, trip. It's a complicated event to pull off. So what we're going to do is we're going to listen to what the travel agency says. Okay. They're the experts and they're going to guide us through any sort of COVID protocols we have to do. So as you heard in the itinerary, there is a COVID test day and we'll have to get our COVID tests done and then the results back before we can fly back to Canada. And what I will just as well mention is vaccinations. Um, Thank you for those of you who have been able to uh, provide your info to us. It's going to be really valuable. But um, just just getting it just getting it on the table out there right away. The vaccinations look like they're required for travel, at least uh, to get on a flight in Canada. So you're going to have to have them. So uh, get it over with now if you have to. That's all I can say on that. So just you know, once again, the key message here is be flexible. Uh, there may be other requirements. May requirements may. Uh, disappear uh, over the next little while. So I uh, just uh, will provide you as all the information as we get it and we'll give you the most up-to-date stuff that we get from the travel agency and make sure that we follow the rules that are required. Okay, so for soldiers coming on the trip, your expectations. So um, no surprise here, you're sponsored by your unit in the branch. You're going to be asked to participate in study groups as we mentioned earlier. There's going to be a series of these evenings where you'll be expected to attend and you'll be expected to contribute to uh, one of the four uh, evenings. 
okay? When you get back from the trip, you will be expected to bring this experience back to your unit. You are the future of the branch. And so expect that you'll be asked to give a briefing to your unit. You may be asked to write an article and we'll be doing some social media stuff that I'm gonna talk about later on in the public affairs uh, slide. And another thing I should mention as well is we'll be thanking our sponsors throughout the trip. So just be prepared for a little bit of promotional stuff. We wanna thank our sponsors. There's some corporate and some private sponsors who uh, have donated a lot of money to make this uh, a possibility for us. And it behooves us to thank them either during the trip or afterwards. And as well, uh, expectations with respect to VIPs. There's gonna be some VIPs that attend with us as uh, you know, retired generals, as, as mentioned. Um, uh, Brigadier General retired O'Keefe and Brigadier General retired Patterson are on the call tonight. So there are some VIPs um, uh, through the trip. So just please, you know, make sure you pay respects and things like that. We'll also be meeting foreign dignitaries and foreign uh, military officers. So just they'll have to, we'll have to pay attention to um, protocols for that as well. On the dress and ceremonial, you know, Hugh just mentioned it, but there's specific days that are going to be DU1A. I believe I may be wrong about this, and we'll just make a correction if we have to. But the second, third, fourth, and fifth of May, there's going to be parades or another formal type of event. Um, so just remember that you'll be using your, you'll be bringing your DU1As for this trip, and uh, yeah, make sure before you go that it fits. And if you do, if it doesn't fit right now, then order a replacement at Logistic right away and get yourself kitted out and tailored. And just so you know, we will be also reporting any of these events to CJOC. They are tracking commemoration of the Second World War events through an operation called Op Distinction. I'm not sure if anybody's heard of those things before, but they've been going for a few years. So just be aware that we will be um, letting CJOC know that uh, we have soldiers participating in parades and contingents in the Netherlands for this commemorative event. And I should say on the other days, the days that are just normal tour days, um, just uh, it'll, it'll be casual dress. And so I would just recommend stuff that's good to go for your for your uh, mess, either the junior ranks, senior ranks or officers mess. That'd be the appropriate clothing to wear. Okay, another thing that this will be important for you and to let your chain of command know, but for Reg Force personnel, we're gonna recommend that the CO approves seven days of special leave it's a type called community affairs and one short that, that will cover all your days off and it won't use any of your animal to, um, to cover this trip. The remainder of the days are on weekends, so you won't have to use any of those. And as for re reserve force, you'll be considered on duty uh, when attending events in uniform. And we're going to be asking your COs to pay for your class A days for those days, which is the second, third, fourth and fifth of May. And otherwise you will not be considered on duty. Okay, so another thing that you need to be aware of is your financial considerations. So the 300 bucks that was mentioned earlier uh, by Hugh, um, that's gonna be, uh, that's the, the expected uh, money that you put in. So you have some skin in the game, so to speak. Um, and uh, I think you'll be contacted in, by the travel agency if you haven't already to put in a deposit. A reminder that the currency when we're over there is in euros, so you want to bring some with you, cash and coins, because the washrooms and toilets cost a little bit of money to use. A uh, reminder, the breakfast and lunches are provided for all the days that are tour, except for the free day. The dinners are not provided. However, I believe this first and last uh, dinners, like the start, the kickoff and the, and the wrap up, uh, those days are provided but you'll be expected to pay for your own dinners otherwise. Okay. And last but not least, public affairs. So we're gonna try and push some social media using the museum's webpage, museum's uh, Facebook and Twitter and things like that. We're gonna be looking to put some, post some uh, content on the Simsen, whether it's an article or the presentations from your study groups. And as well, um, there is, some fundraising that needs to be done still by some units. And I will push out to you a draft social media message that you can use uh, either by yourself or you can ask your unit to publish it on their Facebook page, for instance, to ask um, for donations. 
if you want to donate to the trip, uh, one thing that you have to remember, so there is a charitable, uh, so as part of this, it goes through a charitable webpage called Canada Helps, and you can allocate the money uh, to the uh, c &E Museum, and there's like a category where you can allocate it towards the trip. Um, let's say your mom wanted to donate. So for instance, my mom donated to the, to the, to the trip back in 2020. So she donated, but she just, she just wanted to donate to the trip overall to support all the soldiers. So she just put in the donation. Um, if, if, uh, if your mom wanted to donate and put it in for your unit, she could put in your unit. What I would recommend against is not putting any names into the donation page. Donations are not supposed to benefit yourself. So this is especially applies if you wanted to donate for yourself. If you wanted to donate just to part of the cause, uh, don't put your own name into the remarks uh, column for that. But anyways, I'll provide you information on how to do that. And if you wanted to ask your friends or family to donate some uh, money to the trip. And if they do do that, then they, can, uh, they will receive a charitable receipt that they can claim on their taxes if they contribute over, I think, $20. So anyways, all that to say is I'll provide you a draft social media message if you want to, if you want to help your unit um, fundraise. So that concludes um, my uh, quick highlights of the joining instructions. This is the kind of information that you'll be getting out of it. For the most up-to-date uh, itinerary and things like that, make sure you visit the Simpson page that I have linked here. And um, that will give you all the information you need to know about what's happening on which days. I don't want to duplicate all that. And then, as I mentioned before, um, you can contact myself or the Sergeant Major if you have any questions. And uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll open up the floor now for some questions and then maybe for about five minutes or so. And then after that, just email me the questions. And then what we'll put together is a little FAQ to send back to everybody. So thanks very much, everyone. Now how to figure out how to stop and share. There we go. Hey, was there a question there? Because I heard uh, I heard some audio. I'm not seeing any hands up, so thanks uh, everybody for paying attention. And like I said, I'll be getting you that document uh, in the next couple weeks as we solidify some things. We're still working on the bus uh, transport plan. Um, so those, those kind of final details are required before I uh, send it out. So if you have any further questions or if you think of something tomorrow in the next few days, just feel free to send me an email and um, I'll make sure that I put together a response back to everyone. Thanks again. Uh, thank you, uh, Major Romero. I just want to clarify one point on your, on your joining instructions and that's the aspect of the uh, $300 from the supported member, um, you'll be paying your unit as opposed to paying the travel agency. It'll be a lot easier if you went to your unit. So your unit's gonna be assessed the $2,500 plus the, your contribution of the $300. So the unit will pay 2,800. So you'll pay the unit and then the unit will then uh, pay the um, uh, foundation. So then we can then, um, then pay the travel agency. So if there's no other questions, I'll say the meeting's closed and we'll see you at the next session on the 18th of November, 1900 Eastern. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone, good night.